I teach architects. I teach at the University of Southern California. And so I can uh, try and instruct architects to understand building systems and understand the actual buildings that they're designing. This was a, a, a book which was written as part of an ASHRAE research project. Um, I don't know how many of you look at the ASHRAE design guides as a, as a wonderful source of uh, uh, data for buildings and building systems. And what we found out was that we didn't really play catch up with where CTBUH, which is the Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, which Russell described, of how buildings were going to get on. So uh, this book actually is, is, is a compilation of uh, the tall, the super tall, and mega tall building systems. Um, it's nearly a year old. Already it's getting out of date. That's how hard that the, that the systems are going. Uh, go back one. I go through this very quick. I don't want you to read it. don't want it to be translated, but this is all the items that were in the book, so I'm going to skim through some of them. One of the most important things uh, when we look at this, when we look at the size of the buildings, when we get to 600 meters or even higher, is egress. What happens with the fire? And what we now do, one of the latest developments is we're allowed to use the, ele the, the elevators, the lifts, as a manner of, of means of getting out of the building when there's a fire. So it's another big important thing, also about stairwell pressurization. Some of the biggest things which I will highlight here also are weather data. When we start looking at the, the vertical temperature gradient of buildings, wind velocity and also air density. Um, won't speak too much about systems because Swagon can do that or PM as it's called over here will be able to talk about systems. Um, and then we will look at some of the other a big phenomenon is uh, about natural ventilation. Um, whether or not we can naturally ventilate space, especially high-rise residential. Um, how many people here know about LEED? Is LEED very prominent in Russia? I don't know if we do it. If we, if we do it, well, it's dead, finished. Where we are now, it's out of space. If you talk green buildings or sustainability, you're 10 years too old. And where we're going to move on to is where Russ introduced it is EUI, Energy Use Index. How much energy does a building use from day one? And that's what we start putting in, and that's what we start driving into architects, developers, and clients, and also for people who are going to run the building for us. So it's performance-based design that we're looking at. Uh, these are some of the buildings around here. Um, on the right, I call it the Mori Tower, actually. It's a World Trade Center in, uh, in, in Shanghai, which is Cone, Peterson, and Fox. We got Jin Mao in the middle. I was peer reviewer for Jin Mao. Uh, Shanghai Tower. Was there a pointer on here? Which one? This one. Ah, oh, there we go. This Shanghai Tower, 632. Uh, this one is um, 1,000 meters, one kilometer, Kingdom Tower. And when you look at that, um, we know that there are also, there's a 1,500 meter building on design somewhere, which you know where it is, Russell knows where it is, which is also going into Dubai. Um, when we're talking about the number of buildings that are higher than 600 meters, there are presently 27 either in design or in construction around the world. So it's definitely something that's going to be coming. This is my, some of my experience. This is Plaza 66 in Shanghai. This is way back in 1994. This was the first high-rise building from Cone, Peterson, and Fox in um, China. Petronos Towers, call it what you will. When I was working on it, it was Kuala Lumpur Pacific Center, which is going, if you look at it now, it's dwarfed by the rest of the buildings around it. Uh, this is over Hong Kong, Chung Kong Center. Really just a very, very efficient building. It's a rectilineal, rectangular floor plate. The building works uh, for high banking institutions. This is another Chinese bank, the Pingang Bank. This is in Shenzhen, just across the, the border in from, from Hong Kong. This is over 630, 640 meters high, which is Cone, Peterson, and Fox. These two buildings here, so this is uh, uh, IFC2, and this is uh, ICC. We're looking at those. Uh, one of the things we're going to mention briefly is looking at the actual pumping power of how much uh, the pumps will uh, consume of moving water around a building. These are 440 meters tall. 
Uh, this is Pertamina. This is in Indonesia and Jakarta. Uh, this building is presently on hold, also 605 meters. The Skidmore Owens and Merrill from Chicago. This is the Burj. Everyone's done something on the Burj. We're working on it now because apparently when the elevators come down, the doors open. There's a big pressure, which is stack effect. Something else we'll talk about. Um, if ever you feel like you want to jump off the building, this is what it's going to look like from the uh, top of the Burj. You will reach 200 kilometers per hour and your body won't accelerate anymore until it hits the ground. This is uh, Greenland Suzo. This is just up the road from where uh, um, Russell was talking when, when he's building all these new secondary and third tier cities in, in China are starting to develop buildings this big. Uh, this is uh, a naturally ventilated building in China. Uh, whether it works, it works on the computer. Whether it works in practical terms, we don't know yet. This is parts of it. Uh, also the cost. The main problem with designing uh, a building such as this in China is, as a friend of mine tells me, it's rather like designing a Swiss watch for a country that can only afford a Timex, a very cheap watch. So who's going to maintain this? Who's going to make sure it works after five years or 10 years? Uh, this is um, Binhai, which is an, another one over 600 meters. And this is uh, the top, actually, if you look down to the Shanghai Tower. There's, there's uh, the World Trade Center here. This is Shanghai, and this is Jin Mao. Jim Mao already is 20 years old, I think something 20, 25 years old. So my point of supporting architects like Russell around here is how efficient do we make a building system? What are we really looking at? Because even though you're building very high, what we want to start looking at is what is the core going to be like? What systems do we need to design around the building? How much floor area do we need to get up and down the building? Here's a typical core, which I just realized seems to be upside down, but anyway, what we're trying to do this, uh, a lot of the work we're doing is based around China because that's where the big development has been for these high uh, towers. What will very happen, uh, often happen in Asia, in India, in other places is the uh, local engineers will get hold of it. The local engineers will say, we need spaces on both sides of the core where we can put the mechanical system, and therefore the leasable area on the floor is, is reduced. Then also the floor to floor height, when you start looking at a high building like this, of how many floors you can get in there. So if we can start compacting it by either doing uh, radiant ceilings or active beams or just a very, very efficient overhead VAV system, we can actually reduce even by 100 millimeters or 150 millimeters the floor to floor height, then we can gain tremendous amount of, of savings on the actual facade cost of a building. And again, we're looking at all these uh, different items. All these are in the book uh, about penetrations. We all know this. There's all lots of work with all the latest um, the building, um, the, the, the uh, Navis works and the BIM going around the world where we can have all this coordination between the structure and the um, mechanical systems. Uh, one of the big things, this is again is a facade, so working with architects is, is who orchestrates the facades. Um, I'm, I'm an old guy. I started off when we do load calculations, is the first calculations you do. You know about the heating and cooling calculations and that's it, the way you're going to be. How much actually goes through the facade? If you look at the modern day, um, let us say the, the energy guides, look at ASHRAE 90.1, look at some of the China codes. I'm not really knowledgeable about what happens in Russia. I know there's quite a lot, or they do follow ASHRAE 90.1. Basically, they turn around for any building. They say, we recommend that you only have 40% of the facade as being glazed. If you look at these modern buildings, we're talking 80%. So therefore, you've got to make 80% work to meet code, which is only 40%. This is a diagram put together over the years. When you look at it, probably the weakest and most spectacular material in a building is glass. This is actually the, the, the performance that glass must do. I apologize for not having it in, in Russian, but we have our heat, we, we have uh, radiation, we have summer heat, we have moisture, we have light, we have view. If you look at it, the facade really, really has to work within our building to be some dynamic part of the whole system. 
Again, Russell started showing that we're going to keep on about energy, about kilowatt hours per square meter, which is going to drive and drive again of the overall efficiency and what energy we're going to do. We've all heard about net zero buildings and zero carbon buildings. Well, we need to start designing to zero carbon. Uh, this one, we can see that the, the, the facade load is only 15%. And that's where we are for a modern day building. The facade load shouldn't be more than 20%. So 15 to 20%. You'll see some other ones we get rather higher, but the goal is to get lower than 20%. Um, one of the other points is when we get higher up a building, we're seeing it in the, in the, the weather data, is that the wind velocity increases. So therefore, if you start looking at what the possible leakage rate could be for a building, yet when you go up, you've got a higher pressure. So how do you allow for that in your, in your building? And as engineers, if we have infiltration, and like where we are, February in St. Petersburg, that air temperature is going to be very cold. So if we have twice as much infiltration due to the higher uh, air pressure and the wind velocity, how do we account for that back in our load calculations, which comes back to the size of the equipment we need for our buildings? As I said, the climate data. So there's a lot of information we've done here. This actually is for St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg, Beijing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong if, I, if we design it. But if we start off here, this is uh, during, the, the, during the summer. Uh, the design is about 27 degrees, 28 degrees. Is that right for St. Petersburg? But as we start to go up, and we go up 100 meters, and we go up 300 meters, which is just super tall. We get to 600 meters, which is mega tall. The temperature reduces. So therefore, when we do load calculations, we have to start splitting the building up into segments and then correcting each one of the segments for the different load calculations. The reverse happens during the winter. We start off at minus 27, 26 degrees. And it goes down, so when it goes down there, it's minus 32 at the top. So now we've got two different dynamics going on with our building. Our heating system, actually, as we go up the building, needs to increase inside. Our cooling system from the transmission can decrease as we go up the building. Every time I give a lecture like this, I always see one or two consulting engineers looking at it going, oh, no, I forgot that. And it's something that we need to do when you do it. Again, but what, what happens is people say with a tall building, it's just a, 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 a silly thing that you just take one floor and you just keep multiplying the floor up. You can't do it with these dynamic buildings because over 20, 30 floors, we get different load calculations. The pipes get bigger, the ducts get bigger. Everything needs to be integrated within the space. Um, this is air pressure. Again, why is air pressure? Think about the infiltration that comes into the building. If we then go back one, and then we look at what the outside temperature is going to be, we have at the first 50 meters of the building, it can be minus 27 degrees with a certain pressure. We go up above 300 meters or 600 meters, all of a sudden I got minus 32 degree air infiltrating into my building, which is another problem what we, which we do. The, the, this is the Burj. Um, this actually must be in Fahrenheit, yeah. So 68, 68 with is, is somewhere in the region about 17, 18 degrees Celsius. And as you can see, we come down to about 85, which is just on about 28 degrees, 30. So you can see, even in this short difference, how, how the temperature differential is over the height of the building. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but when we start doing tall buildings, this is the biggest single element that everybody forgets, which is called stack effect. Don't quite know how that translates, but you'll, you'll find this. is basically, what is the pressure differential within a building? And the number one person who wants to know about the pressure differential is the fire marshal, the person looking at a fire. Because if you have a varying pressure differential in a building, how do you stop the air pressure moving around within there? And the first thing that you don't want to do when you have a fire is to have air movement within the building that can actually start moving that around, either uh, illuminating the fire anymore or carrying smoke over to another thing. So now we start looking at this when we get on. Um, which engineers doesn't like a spreadsheet? We all love spreadsheets, okay? So what we've also published as parts of this, this is just one of the many. I want to go through these spreadsheets very quickly now. But again, what you can see is just very simple. All the information for the stack effect. Combine stack effect with wind and with, and with stack. Um, so we have all the calculations where we can start looking at them. 
I'm going to go through this very quick. What we can do here, again, you see on the right-hand side, we can build our building. This is where the core is going to be. This depends what the size of it's going to be. So we can go all the way through. Here we're looking at the pressure differential as we go up and down the building. Uh, again, we build other models. These models on the right-hand side are from the simulation program from eQuest, so we can start looking at it, looking at the building. So then we're going to start looking now back to the facades again. So this is a, another job. This is Hang King. This is in Shenzhen. This is 440 meters. I'm going to take you through this as well very quickly. When you look at the facade and the size of the building. So how do we, how do we calculate? This is all happens in, in the beginning phase of the building. So what we have is we have a code. This is the China Energy Code. It can be ASHRAE 90.1. If we look at it, the number of floors, the outside area, uh, what the temperature is going to be, this is during the summer, 33 degrees. If we look here in the winter, we're, we're six degrees where we are, which is, it, uh, this Shenzhen is just above Hong Kong. So now we can look that here, this is the facade, which is 12 megawatts, or we can bring it to 6.8 megawatts. There's a big difference there in what the basic load is going to be on the building just through looking and engineering the facades, working with the architects to make it work. And in the winter, we go from uh, 19 megawatts to heat the building down to, to 10 megawatts. Again, there's a big number. These are quite big numbers when you look at it. So unfortunately for PM and Svegon, they don't provide as many air handling units or as equipment, but there again for your energy to get to net zero, what we would like to do is to get these, these numbers down to zero. But you can't because of the sheer size of the buildings. Then we start looking at solar radiation. Here we have a bit of a handicap. We go from the, uh, the typical, the China Energy Code at 38 megawatts. 38 megawatts being the amount of solar energy that comes into the building which needs to be cooled to maintain 24, 25 degrees. And if you look on the right hand side, we get 18 megawatts. There's a big number that's come down there. Again, the chillers are smaller, the ductwork is smaller, the pipe work is smaller. The whole building becomes much more in efficient. In the winter, there is a bit of a handicap because we got here 44 megawatts of free heating, which we would like to have, okay? But we can't change the glass because obviously, especially if we get to, to, to like St. Petersburg, if it's minus 27 degrees or during the middle of the, of the, of the winter, today is, is a bit overcast, but if there is sun, you want to get that inside your building, which is passive heating. But because of the performance, we, we bring it down to 21. We've still got 21 megawatts of free heating during the winter to put into the building. So basically, we start looking at these numbers because we're looking at either a code, which is 22 watts a square meter of floor area of how much the, the external load is, and we bring it down to 11. So as you can see, that's a 50% improvement. And the same one we have slightly during the 50% uh, again during the winter, down to 4 watts a square meter, which is the heat load for this part of the universe in the, uh, in the winter. So now what we look again, we can then put these into a, another simulation sheet. Again, this is all work which carries on within the first six weeks or three months of a building design. Not at the end of the design, but starts in the design. Very briefly, we, we have the number of people, we have outside air, we have lights, everything that's on there multiplied by degree days or full load hours. We can then work out what the energy is going to be. Why do we need the energy and what comes from it is the next thing is to start looking at what system do we want. Do we want to go with, with an overhead system from a code? This is a high performance facade. We bring it then, this is per floor from 61,000 cubic meters per hour to 42,000. What happens if we just go with pure ventilation air and we start looking at active beams or radiant ceilings? Then we only need to start moving 8,000 cubic meters per hour around a building. Once we do that, the mechanical room shrink the efficiency of the building, the amount of heat of, of space in the lowered ceiling decreases so we can make the building really start to work. In the winter, there isn't much because most of this is just ventilation, a little bit of, of air in there, and also some pressurization. So um, at the same time, we start looking at thermal comfort. Um, what a lot of people forget when we start doing buildings of this magnitude is when we start looking at these, you're talking anything of 5,000, 8,000 to 12,000 people in that building. When we start looking at energy costs, the energy costs we use mostly from the US, which is also sort of applicable from China, is 
$1.50 per square foot, which works out to $15 per square meter as an electrical cost. You can try and save 30% of that, which is very good. You can save 50%, which is still only about 5 to $7. When you actually look at the cost of people in the building, of how much salaries are going in there to improve the well-being of what the people is going to be, that is a much, much bigger number of where we're going to be. It's probably going to be about $2,000 per square meter. Now, if we can then start improving that by 5% over 8,000 people, that is a much larger number. And that's where we're going to start to go to with performance-driven buildings. That's why I said that there's no more lead, no more sustainability. We're up there for high performance, looking at numbers from day one. Um, mean radiant temperature, which is thermal comfort, which comes from the glass. I'm going to skip through this. Um, ventilation air, we've all, all heard, we, we, we take a lot of this for granted, but we only need to bring about a certain amount of air into the space for people to breathe, it means you fresh air. But also we've started looking, we'll show some later when we're doing some air studies, of how much contaminant or contamination is in the outside air. And if we start bringing that within the building, well, what's going to happen with it uh, to the people in the um, there again, we, we start on this other, I call it from the, the green beaners and the tree huggers, but we have to go with natural ventilation. How clean is that outside air when we start looking at it? Anybody that's been here that designs hospitals, we know how we have to then clean the air out, he HEPA filters or special coal filters, what they're going to be, to actually take all the contaminants out so we can import that into the building so we don't contaminate people further. This is Pearl River with uh, Russell and mine. This is the biggest net zero building in the world. Russell was forgetting to tell you. Any idea why it's net zero? It's not occupied. There's no one in the building. It still has photovoltaic pa uh, panels on the side of the building. It still has turbines in the building because no one's there. It was scheduled to have 8,000 people in it. It's 2.2 million square, 220,000 square meters. So then we start looking at the puzzle, how we put all this together, mean radiant, temperature, air velocity. So this is some part of it, of looking at when we were looking at the occupation for, or the occup occupied part of, of Pearl River. This is a floor plan. This is then looking at the, the PPD, the percentage of people dissatisfied. So how many people then, so we start looking at it, if we design a certain system or use a certain glass, of how many people could complain in a building. Bearing in mind there are about 8,000 people in this building. So here, when we're looking across with the yellow, is like about 20%. So therefore, we can predict designing a building that 20% of those people could complain due to the lack of comfort within the space. So it's not good. So how do we do it? So we start looking around for different choices. And we get the green, we get below 10%. So therefore, with the mixture, which was actually the radiant ceiling, and there was also a double skin facade and the underfloor distributions, when it all comes together, we get less than 10%, which is the minimum level that we have for compliance for thermal comfort. Something else we've been looking at as well, this is actually comes from uh, Autodesk, is, is looking at thermal comfort over the, over the building. There was also where, where Petra went to school with DTU with Madsen many years ago looking at this. Uh, with the modern day computers, you can actually model the thermal comfort over a human body in the computer, or in, in, in the simulation in the design. Um, HVAC systems, we all know, VAV, fan coils, underfloor displacement, everyone, there's not many new developments. There is, I will tell you, actually, um, active beams, chilled beams, call them what we will. Everybody thought that we were going to revolutionize the wheels. These actually are going down. We thought they were going to be selling a lot of people, but people aren't using them because of, of difficulties with condensation and with controls. So uh, they, were, they were the hot spot, I think, you know, two years ago, and now they've more or less um, disappeared, not disappeared, just data. This is the big one coming in, I think you know it, VRV, variable refrigerant flow, which comes in, especially if you're doing sub-metering. But I don't think there's anything new here. So we'll move on. Uh, Petra told about the, the design guide for, for the active beams that no one's using. <laughs> um, 
then you make a basis of design document. So the base of design starts again within three months of how it's going to be used. Very handy for the contractor to understand how the building is going to be operated, what, what's being designed or what is going to be constructed. Also for the other teams. So again, these are some of the numbers that we can get with a good item, with a good facade. We can get 46% below. But just looking at the facade of the building in comparison, not the whole building, because when we put the whole building, uh, we've got the rest of the energy to go in. When we look at the winter, we're down. So there is a potential with certain buildings where we can really optimize the building, really make it energy efficient. Again, I come back to these numbers, uh, again, uh, from the, to show what the different systems would be if it's just an all-air system. Why? Because we want to reduce the, ki the, the, the kilowatt hours. Once we know what the kilowatt hours are going to be reduced, divided by the square meters of the building, we've got our energy use index. It's a way of saying how the building works. And here we can look around and we can see where we're going to be, whether it's active beams. The VAV plus is very simple. It's a fan coil with a variable speed drive, which comes in. So it's, it becomes by default a VAV plus. Fan power, obviously, because when we go with active beams and VAV plus, we've got very small fan power because we're doing it as a water-based system, which Russell also mentioned. So the pump power, where we're going to be. And this is really where we are. There's a direct comparison, the correlation between KWH per square meter and CO2. This is what we want to know about, isn't it? This is this is this is this is green engineering day one. Is what actually is the CO2 emission of the building I'm designing. So we start taking some responsibility of what we're actually producing in 10 years' time when the building gets up and running and gets occupied. Um, Big discussion, um, whether we go central uh, fan rooms or we go floor by floor fan rooms. Again, it's, it's very difficult from project to project. It depends how the project really works out. Um, so we've got most of those in, uh, as we're all well aware of the, uh, the layout of the air handling units. And we always know that the architect never gives us enough room to get the ductwork in there, to get the air handling units in there, or to be able to take them out in the event of maintenance. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to the next one. So again, um, we've developed these, these different diagrams. We've put them in there of showing of how you can actually start calculating them because we know what the air is per floor, what we want. So whether we want to go from central units or decentral units. And this is very simple for this building here. I think that's, uh, this one actually is 142 stories. So when you start talking 600 meters plus, you're up to 160, 180 stories. So it gives you some idea. When you actually start looking at what the size of the ducts are going to be, uh, then they become they c they begin to be significant to going up through the building, and there you're losing valuable floor space through the transportation of the air system. Um, chiller plants, yeah, they get bigger. But nothing much there. Dynamic over the years for just different chiller plants. This is where we've been looking at it from the water distribution system, um, because. Uh, we all learn the hard way is that when we have our valves in the system, there's only a certain amount of pressure, so many kPa you can have on the valve where it starts bursting through the valves. So if we know and we look, everything's fine if you keep the pumps running. As soon as you turn the pumps up, then you have two columns of static water coming down. So if you start working out what the pressure would be of 600 meter high building on the static pressure, you know full well it's going to go through the, the maximum capacity that your valves and your fittings are going to have. So what we then do is we have to split the building up with, uh, with pressure brakes to get up there. We all know as well that a heat exchanger, we need an approach, a temperature approach. So if we need six degrees Celsius at the top of the building, which we need for our last cooling coil, for example, we can't produce six degrees Celsius from the chiller because we're going to lose it. So what then means is when we start running the chiller at two and three degree chilled water, what happens to the capacity? The capacity goes down because the net positive, the, 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 the pressure that the, the, the compressor has to do is twice as much, and therefore we get an extra penalty. But not only that, what about the pumping power to lift that water up? If this was 600 meter high, then what we're looking at here, we're looking at uh, three, three blocks of 200 meters. So we've got to take the water up 200 meters. We've got to go through a, a heat exchange, then we've got to pump it another 200 meters up. What happens to all that pump power where are we going? Another spreadsheet. What about what is a, a, a good 
temperature differential? What should we what should we rerun? Should we go from 5.6 down to 2.2? We can play around with different then You've got to look at what your chiller performance is going to be. What sort of chiller is it going to be? Can you get down to two degrees? Put it in the spreadsheet and we do it. Um, for the, what we've also done is uh, all these spreadsheets are available um, uh, in the book. And I also have them here on a USB, so if anybody wants to borrow these, we can do this. There's nothing more frustrating than sitting through a presentation, being shown all these different spreadsheets and not being able to tell where they're going to be. And what engineer doesn't like a spreadsheet, at least to start with? So these spreadsheets are available for everybody. So it's not just the uh, Christmas without any presents. What we're looking about here is we're looking here these different numbers, because ASHRAE 90.1 says Whatever size your uh, your plant's going to be, you cannot use more than this kilowatts, the power, to actually uh, move the water around. So we've got to start looking at where we're going to be and what the pumps are going to be in efficiency. And we come out to these numbers if we start looking around here. So you imagine if you add this up of how many kilowatts on pumping is in, they're going to be in a simple building. yeah. And then you start looking with some of these buildings that do run 24 hours a day. Or if you have a 600 meter building, uh, a, a, a typical division is the first 200 meters is offices. The second 200 meters is probably going to be condominiums or apartments. And the top 200 meters is going to be a high rise hotel. High rise hotel runs 24 hours a day. That means you've got to pump your water 24 hours a day to the top part of the building. We can put the chiller plant at the top and pump down, but you've still got to get all the water up there in the first place, okay? Many ways. So then we start looking at energy modeling, uh, how we model it, what numbers there are. There's a, there's a story going around, uh, and it's an American story from uh, one Bryant Park, which is the Bank of America building. They went in there and they looked at what was the, the energy use index, and they came out with the number, and the number in KBT per square foot was 317. Well, if you multiply that by three and a half, you get the kilowatt hours per square meter, which meant it was more than a thousand kWh per square meter, and it was supposed to be a lead platinum building. And this is how corrupt the whole lead system is. How can a building be situated there with lead platinum in the middle of New York City at a thousand kilowatt hours per square meter? Can't happen can't happen. So who was right, who was wrong? So the other thing is we put these different numbers in there when we do the modeling to actually guide people. We all know what it's like. Five o'clock on a Friday afternoon, six o'clock, you're trying to get a job finished, you've got all this data. What is the correct data that you can give to the rest of your design team or your boss or your architect to show you how accurate the building is going to be? And that's why we put all this information in there. So the number where Russell was shown, which we had in there, is a fairly accurate number for, for uh, uh, one of these buildings, you know, a super tall building, is around about 300, 350 kWt, uh, kilowatt hours per square meter, which is a fairly good number. Also dependent upon the climate, because that's also another one that was going to derive it. We're hoping to get down a lot lower, and we will, but at presently that's where we are. So again, you see some of these numbers, so you see 292 down to 241. Yeah, every bit helps. We want to start getting it down. We'd like to get it down to zero, but that's that's not going to happen in the very near future. Um, vertical transportation systems, if you start looking at the number of elevators, whether they've got single elevators or multiple, the only reason we may really put this in there, not for elevator systems, but also because they can be used from egress, from how many people you can get out of a building in the event of a, of a fire. Um, plumbing. Um, there's nothing exciting you can say in the world about a plumbing system. There's nothing, except for when you think about the pressures again, when you start bringing the water down through a building, of what pressure you actually get. So you have to have pressure breaks at different floors. Um, the life safety, uh, again, sprinkler, we know that pressure. Um, this is where the, a big discussion has been going around the world, especially in Asia, especially in India, is high-rise residential. So as I say, if we say that the first 200 meters is offices and the second 200 meters, which means you're 200 to 400 meters above the ground, right? And you're paying uh, uh, 10 million US dollars for one of these apartments. Why can't you open the door? 
and sit on a balcony. And when you start looking at it, the first person who's going to say no is the fire marshal, because as soon as you do that, you've got a different pressure differential through your building. And what happens to fire and smoke should there be a fire and smoke within the building? Other than that, how, how um, healthy is it? You know, what's the sort of uh, the contamination in the air? The big news coming around is PM 2.5. There's a big row of them. But your PM 2.5 is, is the value. So again, if you go back to, to, to St. Petersburg, where we're looking, if we turn around and say what the temperature differential is going to be between 200 meters and 400 meters, and we do it on, st on stack effect, which is on buoyancy driven. What about the temperature differential? I've got different temperature differentials for different heights as I go up my, my building to see what's going to happen at the low level uh, uh, residential to the high level residential, the higher level. And so all this needs to be taken into account. So this comes from the graph. And as we all know from, from days at school, engineering college, that we're supposed to be within the lines with our dots, and this is where we can see that we're not. So the fact is when we start looking to see what are we compliance. So this is the, these are the number of hours that the, this temperature occurs. This is something else that we never ever do in engineering, but it comes from ASHRAE. The Americans, are, 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 are this is their problem, where they have the, the mean monthly outdoor temperature. Now, you start designing an HVA system for a mean temperature, it's never going to work, right? We always go to min and maximum. And then we start looking about this. And there's also, uh, it should be the operative temperature, which is mean So there's lots of problems to be done here. The idea being is that the two middle lines show 90% uh, compliance, and the two outer lines are 80%. And this has been derived as, as adaptive comfort. There's the a European, the ISO is very similar. And so this is what we're looking for, naturally ventilated buildings. This is another one from China. Again, uh, when I was at school, we were told that all the dots were supposed to be within the lines. And so these are the results. So again, be very, very careful when you look at natural ventilation. It's not just a question of opening the window or opening the door. You have to be very careful of what's going to happen. Um, this is another one big discussion. Natural ventilation doesn't include any maximum levels for humidity. If you look at ASHRAE 955 for thermal comfort and some of the European standards, it has a, a level in there at 0 0.12 um, kilograms per, uh, grams per kilogram of looking of saying that's the maximum number of, of moisture. I should have turned this around to get a Mollier diagram, but this is a carry. Just hold it up to the mirror backwards. So if we then start looking, this is the number of hours for this particular um, place. This is Atlanta in Georgia, fairly, fairly humid. So what we say is that anything above that line cannot be considered because that air is too moist to go into the space. Okay, so it's not all those hours. We have to look at it. If you look what the number of hours it says that somewhere in the region about 1,100 hours. Well, if you start deducting the number of hours in this part, you come to 500. So again, it's not as dynamic as we think it is. This is, again, this is just uh, a, who doesn't like a spreadsheet, as I said. This is when you look at a typical floor plate with all the dynamics that you have. Um, what about the pressure differential, especially in a condominium uh, with a bathroom fan? What about when you have washers and dryers? So we've got all these dynamics, and this is just one of the simple <laughs> spreadsheets that we can put together to find out what the overall pressure is going to be, the pressure balance per floor, and then you have to look at each floor of the building as we go out the building. Um, this is also another list to go through of do's and don'ts for natural ventilation. Uh, I'm not going to go through e each one, but it turns around and says what the maximum heat gain can be in the space and how many meters from the facade you can be. And it basically it says if you comply with everything, then you can do natural ventilation. So it's something to look at. Unfortunately, you've got to buy the book to get this list. This is um, uh, Beijing. Uh, we have a polluter. I have a pollutant thing on my iPad. I can look, and on this particular day, the maximum you can get is 500. On this one, it's 500. It basically says don't go outside and do not breathe until it d disappears. I think the maximum limit for, for the PM 2.5 is, I think, 50. Uh, this is at 14,300. All right. 
And you'll see lots of these will start coming into buildings on the building management system now to actually start looking and measuring what the outside pollutant's gonna be. Um, electrical systems. Uh, I don't know about you, if there's any electrical engineers here, but you give them two wires and they still can't connect them in the right order. You give them three wires because they got an earth in there, they got no idea what's gonna happen like that. The only reason the pumps don't run is not because they're selected batteries, because the electrical engineer has wired it up backwards, yeah? So enough about electrical engineers. This is also another big one coming. I, I think that we're all in the same um, trade. How many times is it when we design a building or we put a control system in the building that either between the contractor, the bid phase, or what happens, that half of the controls get omitted because we don't need that? This is what's coming in. These modern buildings called smart buildings, you're gonna have so much controls in there to control everything. Everything's gonna be looked at. Every, every pump, every movable object, every chiller, air handling unit, every fan, to make sure that it stays within that limit and that the whole building is operated. So these are just some of the many parts. And then obviously the integration of photovoltaics, of wind turbines, of how it's all gonna be there. What it's also gonna do is uh, different parts. Uh, you're going to have to start looking and downgrading or turning off parts of your equipment if the source energy is also producing too many CO2. We don't know where it is. I think a lot of the electri electricity in Russia comes from coal. So if you want to start looking at then how much to reduce your emissions, you can actually start looking at a smart building of regulating your electrical use within the building to actually s to reduce the amount of source contamination from, uh, especially from coal places. So we can look at this uh, electrical vehicle charging. So again, it's looking at the intelligence of where the building is going to be. Also, um, it's like diagnostics. What's wrong with the building? How many of us have to go to a building where the building owner says, oh, I don't like it, it's not running. Well, what's wrong with it? Well, you can't tell. So again, with all this uh, uh, information, it will actually like go into the doctor when you get a, a health checkup. They go through everything to check everything. And this is what happens you know, every minute with the building management system and reports it back. Okay, thank you, you've been very patient. Any questions? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, if you have any questions, you can ask the questions in Russian language or English language, but you have to use the microphone so the ladies in a booth can translate uh, the answers and the questions as well. Thank you very much. This presentation was really very interesting. My question is, what is the minimum requirement for air in your project? The requirements, the, the quality of the air or the... The, the volume, the amount of the for per, per person? Uh, yeah, a, a guideline would be about 10, li 10 liters per second in metric. Um, but we can go down to about five liters per second if you look at demand controlled ventilation. So mostly it's done in accordance with our ASHRAE 62.1, which is the guideline. The China Energy Code has one which is very similar. So between five and 10 liters per second, but um, I tend to use 10. Please tell me how often and how effectively do you use the renewable energy? when designing buildings. And the energy efficient facades, that's clear, but uh, some other solutions probably. Good question. Um, we're, Peter and I worked on the Pearl River Tower and that had some photovoltaics and also had four wind turbines. Um, to be perfectly honest, buildings are not really the best way to harness either wind or, or, or solar energy uh, in terms of return on investment. Um, the Pearl River Tower, um, uh, we had a story on the Pearl River Tower. That was originally going to be a net zero building and we didn't get there. But we did get a building that was 40, 45% more efficient 
than the China code, uh, which is pretty impressive. Um, in the beginning, when we designed the building to get down to net zero, we had all sorts of uh, uh, systems to get us to net zero, one of which, or two of which, were the use of PVs and um, the wind turbines. Um, then our client told us that he couldn't afford all of these systems, so uh, I was asked to kind of uh, decide which was the 20 most cost-effective solutions. And uh, at that point, we lost the wind turbines and we lost the photovoltaics because they just didn't, didn't make it. And uh, we made a presentation to our client and uh, he said, Russell, he said, where's the wind turbines? And I said, well, they're gone. And because uh, you told me uh, I needed the best 20 systems. And he said, no, 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 you have to get them back on the building because that was the identity of the building. So a lot of these systems from an architectural point of view um, are done for symbolic reasons. So, you know, you'd be much better having a wind farm or whatever rather than putting wind turbines on a building. It doesn't really make sense on a building by building basis. Um, the photovoltaics on Pearl River Tower are quite interesting because what we did manage to do, in, at least in design terms, is that um, PV, PVs. Uh, is it AV, uh, alternating current, they generate, they ge generate direct current. And the problem with um, harnessing energy from uh, PVs is that you normally have to convert that electricity into AV. So that in itself is, is, um, is a kind of waste of energy. The one building component that we can actually hook up to the DC system was the uh, external blinds, or the blinds that were in the cavity. So we didn't have to convert any of that energy. And the other beauty of that is that the blinds are only, need to requ are only required when the sun is shining. So there we had a directly responsive idea from using the PVs and harnessing them in, a, in a, an effective way. But typically, um, PVs and wind turbines really are not what you would do if you were trying to use your money wisely or effectively. Right. It's just a fact. Can I give an engineer's aspect of that? Um, the world is as green as, as the money that the client has. And people just want to look at PVs. And when I started 40 years ago, PVs were going to be tumbling in price. And PVs are now the same price. And people forget the inverters and what goes on. The best thing we can do to get to net zero is if we look on how many buildings we have electrical generators that just sit there which get started once a month on a Monday just to run to see what they're going now. If you start running that and you produce a total energy system so you're making electricity which is going to supply your building, you're taking the heat off to run through absorption chillers or to heat the building. The fact of the matter is it goes back to the owners and operators of the building. Do we want to take that risk can we do, or do we want to make that extra investment to do it? As soon as you do that, you're cutting down all your distribution losses that you're getting because you're doing it direct. And if you're doing it with them with natural gas, you'll burn it very quickly. Then what happens is they start turning, what about the maintenance people? And until the whole majority of the world turns around and decides, I want to take and accept the responsibility, it doesn't matter how many PVs you put there or how many wind turbines are there, you're never going to get down to that low energy on that part. More questions? Yes. You coming? Oh, there's one, there's one more. So we start with the gentleman. Thank you very much for your presentation. And following this discussion, I would like to hear how and how large you use heat pumps. So do, do you use heat pumps at all? This. There's two answers to that. If you want a lot of trouble in life, you can use heat pumps. If you want to do it properly, keep them split up. Um, <laughs> honest answer. Um, heat, heat, pumps are, heat pumps are one of two things. They're either very good or very bad. And you have to look at what the changeover system is going to be. Um, I think we answer our own question if you look at heat pumps. Of what is the percentage of heat pumps in the market? 
They look great in the brochures. I don't know if PM does them or Swagon does them. They look really good. But when you actually come down to do them, they're there. One thing we forget, if I may. So, so I hope I answered it. I, I've only had trouble with heat pumps. I've never tried. I try and avoid them personally. But we all have a great heat pump. How many buildings you have when you have just a plain chiller system? You can elevate the condenser temperature from that chiller while you're still running it to get chilled water, depending, especially hospitals or especially other buildings you've got it, and you can take all that condenser heat out of it. The COP goes down, but it doesn't really go down because you're getting both chilled water out of it and heating water out of it. Yeah? And, 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 and that's one of the things we forget. We just need to play around with, 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 with the Carnot number, right, for the COP and see where we are. Getting back to the thing about um, heat pumps, I think you probably asked the wrong person because you probably gathered that I don't really like heat pumps, so I don't use them. I haven't done them in 25 years. But maybe that answers the question. I'm sorry. He could probably answer better than me. Yeah. You can ask. Uh, спасибо вам. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. We learned a lot. As for the renewable energy sources, several years ago, two or three years ago, there, were, uh, there was the same event uh, held here, and uh, people from a country, I forgot which, which uh, country it was, they uh, mentioned as an example a, a tall building in Canada which used uh, renewable energy sources, including water from, from Ontario Lake. I, I, I think that you know about this project. But in fact, my question is uh, about another uh, something, something else. I would just add that uh, a high rise building, in case of accident, how do you provide to evacuate people from there? Because it's a very urgent, very pressing issue. Uh, in fact, once I saw a fire in a high rise building, and in fact, uh, people just did their best to, to, to get down. Some even jumped from balconies, uh, nobody helped them. Some just were, were running on their balconies, waiting for a, res for a rescue team. So how do you solve this problem in your high-rise buildings? Thank you. you um, good question. Life safety is the most important, and um, it's only needed. Um, there, were, there, were, there were two major effects in, in America which led people to do it. The first one, many people forgot, it used to be the MGN Hotel in Las Vegas, which is now the Bali's. And, uh, and it wasn't very high, it was on the 17th floor. But because there was a fire within the building, they were throwing chairs and breaking windows to try and get out to get oxygen. And it was the worst thing they could do because as soon as they'd done it, they got this backdraft, they changed all the pressure within the building and it just spread all the way through the building. And, they, they, and it was only, let's like say, 17 stories so they, they could get the people out there. That was the first one. The big one is 9-11, right? When the Twin Towers went down, what happened was that in the old way and the way it goes, if there's a fire in the building, the elevators go straight down to the lowest level. They're only used by the fire brigade if they want to. So the only other way up the building is through the stairwells. So what then happens is you have the people coming from the top of the building down the stairwells, and then you have the fire people going upwards. Yeah? And that was where the big problem was. That's where most of the people died actually in 9-11 was the fact that they couldn't get out from that. So now what's looking is they'll be coming on these high rises dedicated elevator for the fire. So the fire go, firemen go in the building and go up through in a dedicated elevator and all the stairwells are pressurized and that's for the egress route. Yeah, it, it's, it's a big question um, that hopefully we don't have to try it out. But that's where we are now. Um, well, the other thing is that we can't design buildings to respond to extreme events, which are 9-11, otherwise nothing would get built. So. Um, one of the issues with the uh, World Trade Center was those cumulative decisions is that there's not much you can do about an aircraft going into your building at 400 tons traveling at 500 miles an hour. I mean, no, no building and no systems will actually defy that. So, and in that problem, what they had really was a situation where they had uh, uh, you know, an airplane crashing into a building that had aviation fuel on it that actually, you know, is obviously an extreme event. So there were other issues re resolving around, uh, revolving around that, that, that. That was a building that was built in the 70s. There'd been a number of internal fit-outs. So when people, new tenants came in, 
they were taking down ceilings and they were hanging new ceilings, hanging new building systems. And what had also happened is that they'd, over the years, knocked off a lot of fire protection on the steel, steel work. So we had this kind of um, event whereby we had an extreme situation and we had a, a defective building that ended up in progressive collapse. And uh, basically what happened is that because the building, uh, because the plane flew in at the high level and, and the steelwork failed, it just, the whole building collapsed before everybody could um, effectively escape. Now, when we design tall buildings, we don't design for everybody evacuating the building. So that, that's not a reasonable request because, um, you know, some of the buildings that Peter and I showed today, they could have 12, 18,000 people. So if you evacuate a building like that all at once, you're going to have 18,000 people evacuating onto the streets, which even if they could do it, would cause another extreme event in terms of some other potential disasters. So typically what we do in terms of building code is that um, if there were if there was a fire, which is a more likely event in, a, in an office building or whatever, rather than an airplane crashing into your building, we would evacuate the, the, the floor that has the fire and the floor above and the floor below. So three floors would be evacuating down the building. But even if you were on the 80th floor, the expectation is not that you get down to street level. It's that, uh, you know, you would go to a floor of refuge. So uh, in China now, every... Uh, 45 meters, which is effectively now 10, 10 office floors, or, or the 11th floor, you would have a, a what we call a place of refuge, which is where you would be expect to go in the event of a fire, and you would go there, and uh, you would hope that the fire brigade or, or, or the emergency services would, would deal with the, the task in hand. And in New York, which is part of a reaction to the 9-11 event, They've actually now, in building code, as Peter mentioned, that you can actually now use the elevator in the event of a fire. So in, in tall building, it's always going to be an issue, um, you know, uh, evacuating a building for, a, for an extreme event. But uh, um, we're not usually typically designing to extreme events like a terrorist attack or whatever. I'd just like to add to his excellent um, response. Um, one of the problems we have is, is the people that make the law like in Asia, you have safe havens, areas of refuge, which is there to get it. In America, they won't have safe havens, so it's, it's contradictory. You know, most American architects work in Asia and work in other places, uh, yet America says we don't want any safe havens within our buildings. If you have a look at a hospital, hospitals, again, also have safe havens. When I was doing designing hospitals, you would actually shut down half the place, half the hospital and just work in one place, completely isolated, until the fire or whatever happened was, was finished. So hopefully that answered the question. Window air conditioners and air heaters, are they widespread, both of them, and why? Air heaters and window conditioners. No. Um, the, it, it, the, there's actually a very, very good uh, follow-on to the question. So, yeah, the, the, the window air conditioners and the wall conditioners, because they're cheap, and why they do them in America, which is, I say, is the cheapest country in the world for construction, even cheaper than China is, uh, because it becomes then the owners of that apartment, it becomes their responsibility, and not the, not the tenant, not the office. So if it breaks down, you have to, you, nobody repairs it, you buy a new one. Okay, now, in, in countries like India, where the, uh, the welfare is growing, now what happens, people are just going to Home Depot in India, or where the local store, and buying one of these air conditioners and putting them in. So now what's happening to all the CO2 because it's, it's, you're using ele electricity, but then what are people uh, doing then? It's running up the cost. So now is it going to be more, more beneficial? Is it going to cost more? So how do you regulate that? So the answer is, again, like the heat pumps. I don't like those either. We go back to central systems. Yeah, Does that answer the question? So the question was about the sources of heat for tall buildings. 
What are they in those countries where climate is cold? What is the source of energy and the source of heat? And is it obligatory, according to the norms in America and in other countries, to have some reserves for these sources in case of emergency? Typically, it's no different than, I think, large parts of, of, of where Russia is. It's natural gas, which most of the heat, which the boilers are driven with. In some spaces, such as uh, China, such as Beijing and Shanghai and Chicago, they have a district steam system, so the buildings can re uh, uh, obtain heat from that. And as far as redundancy goes, in typical, the rule of thumb is that they have heat exchanges, which always do two-thirds of the capacities from that way. Um, in some of the tall buildings, as I say, we start to use, uh, convert the emergency generator to the core we call a total energy system. So it produces electricity, runs 24 hours a day, and then the heat goes either to heat the building or to absorption chillers with chilled water. So no different than, uh, than the majority of the rest of the world. And it depends on the client and it depends on the type of the building as to how much redundancy you want to build in the, into, a, into the building. One of the problems in China is that natural gas is not very prevalent, so most of the energy is coal-fired. So it's kind of difficult to do a high-performance building when you're relying on coal-fired uh, power stations. <laughs> 